so welcome all. Um, and you all have the agenda. I'm going to go back and forth between turning, sharing the screen. So you all got the package that I shared. I, I'll put it up from time to time, but I like seeing people's faces. So I won't do it up all the time. Um, so let me just start with public comment. Do we have any of our public wants to comment? Okay, um, I'm assuming that's no, where I, um, I think we can let people speak during the meeting unless we get really behind. So if you have something on an item you wanna talk about, you're welcome to, uh, Rachel, are you raising your hand? Yeah, that was a process note that um, Fred Bettle was here to address the <clears throat> dual, dual use solar. Um, and I was assuming that he could, um, that we would be able to have a little back and forth when the agenda item came up. That's fine. And I don't, okay. we're not stuck in the order of the agenda. Would you rather do that first while Fred's here? I, I would, I would, yeah, that would be great. I believe um, so that Fred doesn't have to sit in the whole meeting. Okay. I, I think, you know, I think it's pretty concise. So, okay. But is that okay oh. with you, Fred? Sure, I might need my tech support over here, Kristen. Okay. Okay. Um, well, I'm going to actually try to do a PowerPoint. All right. Let me let's share your screen, Fred. Give me one second. Okay. So, oh. the slideshow here. Are you doing shot? Are you doing share yeah. screen? I, I think so. He doesn't have rights yet. So just give me see a second. Ask if people can All see right. it. Sort of do now. All right. Just yes, ask you if people can see it. Can you, people you see be able to share your screen now? Okay. Can people see that map? No, nope. it's not up yet. It's not up yet. <clears throat> Hold on. Oh, yeah, hit the share anything? screen. Yeah, here we go. There we go. Can you share your screen? Oh, I think you have to ask. Um, they already see. said yes. Oh, um, I, I made him a co-host, so we should be able to do it. There you go. Cool. Now, now they see it. All right. Can we do this? Yeah. Lecture? All right. Yeah. All right, let me get back yeah. to the slideshow. Oh, how <laughs> it do that? That thing. How about that? Okay. Okay. All right. Sorry about that. Do you want me to print out the eye thing? Sure. Okay. Okay. This this map shows a general location of the Northampton Meadows. This is one of the largest areas of prime farmland in Massachusetts. It's you know debatably, and I'm talking about the area that's starting from the airport here at the top of the screen and going down to the Oxbow. It crosses on both sides of the freeway. It's the East Meadows and the West Meadows. Um, it's about 3,000 acres altogether, apparently. The Northampton Ag Commission has sent comments to the state Department of Energy Resources opposing the use of the meadows for large scale solar installations here, including the so-called dual use type of solar. Now this farmhouse is in the East Meadows. It's grandfathered into the floodplain. It's the Chernecki house. There's almost no allowed new building, which is one reason why the, this land is still farmland. Solar development is also strictly limited to the city's zoning ordinances, and we farmers on the Ag Commission support that restriction. However, other towns in our region are seeing solar development plans in similar floodplain farmland. Northampton has big sky country. We were known as the Meadow City in the 19th century. In the 1960s, the freeway cut off this land from public awareness, but it is still here as fertile and as rich as it has always been. This land excels at the growing of crops. These are potato hills. The yield is staggering. This is considered some of the world's most productive soil formed at the bottom of glacial Lake Hitch Hitchcock and redeposited by the river that used to be thought of as the Nile River of New England because of the frequent floods which deposited feet of new topsoil on a regular basis. Dam building has reduced those floods considerably of late. The meadows are also important for conservation, including Arcadia Wildlife Refuge, Northampton's Rainbow Beach Conservation Area, and there's also great opportunities for habitat creation on working farms. The meadows are also one of the best places in the state for bird watching. Many different crops have been grown here or could be grown here. Native Americans brought the corn culture here at least 1000 years ago. But under the so-called dual use solar, the only crop shown to work is sheep grazing. This is a low value crop with almost no market demand. Moreover, the multi-million dollar solar arrays 
which are owned by international investment firms like Berkshire Hathaway, would turn farming into a minor use of some of the land in the world that's best suited for farming. On my farm, we grow strawberries and blueberries and flowers, such as the flowers behind me. We operate as pick your own because we believe the meadows are a place that everyone should experience. This is a landscape that is used in just about the same way it has been used for a thousand years. Even the farm lanes out there are the same ones that were laid down in the 1650s. The farmers on the Ag Commission take very seriously our role as the stewards of this place. And I'm talking about people like Rich Jasky, who many people here probably know, and Chip Parsons, both of whom farm in the meadows. We know that the future generations will need to use this land for food just as much as our forebears did. Call us conservative, but I couldn't be more proud than to have a small section of this cherished landscape to farm and take care of as best as I can. Thank you. Thank you, Fred. Rachel, do you want to add anything? Yeah. yeah, I just wanted to add that the Ag Commission um, has, has, you know, has consensus on this and has sent a letter and I, I, I could have Chris send it around. Um, I, I shared it with you and uh, Chris Wayne, but so the Ag Commission, you know, has, has already discussed this and is behind it. And just so you, yeah, so Fred obviously is a local farmer high in the sky. Um, yeah, I think that's all I, and um, maybe Fred could speak to, you know, we, we do have current zoning that that is containing this, but um, Fred can speak to in some communities um, the, the, the zoning has been superseded and that's a kind of a concern for the future. That's all I would add. So I, I'm gonna call on Gordon next, but just be, before I do it, just, is there an ask or you just, is this is educational? I'd say this is educational. Okay. All right, we, there might be at some point that we could endorse the Ag Commission statement or we, you know, be prepared for, you know, further action, maybe Fred, but yeah, we just wanted you all to know about it. <laughs> okay, Gordon, you're up. Uh, I'm going to read a statement in a, just a second that I'm, I've uh, submitted to Chris to put into the record for the meeting. Uh, I want to say one, a couple things. One, the, uh, that house that you just showed there, my uncle lived in that house for years, the Chernecki house. Uh, I walk my dog down in the meadows every single day. I am intimately familiar. I've been uh, running down there for 10 years. Uh, so I'm going to start off in this spot here on general philosophy. Uh, farmland, which is in current production of food crops that are consumed locally within 100 miles and thus needed to ensure the food supply of the local population should be preserved. The way in which land is farmed matters. There's a difference between crop production for local consumption and the production of export crops that primarily support the current system of industrial agriculture in this country. Farming practices, which are polluting to our environment and toxic to our residents should not be considered sustainable use of our prime farmland. We must understand that solar panels and the infrastructure that is used to install them, such as racks, footings, and wiring, do not in any way permanently alter the viability to farm the land upon which they are sited. They can be removed at the end of their life cycle and the land can be restored to agricultural purposes. I wish you could hear this, Kristen. On Northampton's prime agricultural land specifically. The area known as the Meadows is currently used for industrial agriculture. Only two crops were grown in the Meadows this year. Corn, and I mean cattle corn, exported for food for cows and pigs to markets all over the country. I wish you could. Eat. And potatoes was the only two crops that were produced in the meadows. Also produced in massive volume. My understanding is that they go to Lay's potato chips and directly consume to the unhealthy eating habits of this country. C, both crops were heavily sprayed. 
I do not know with what. D, the riparian border. And I don't know if everyone knows what a riparian border is, but it is a border of trees which is planted around farmland to capture the runoff from that farmland, capturing excess nutrients uh, and uh, toxins that may have been sprayed to fight against bugs or uh, any number of things. The riparian border is the tree line which captures all of those pollutants. The riparian border on the meadows is destroyed. There are multiple spots where the farm fields run directly up to the river embankment. All of the nutrients which are sprayed upon the meadows flow directly into the Connecticut River and cause a tremendous amount of downstream damage. Uh, all of the dead zones in the ocean come from agricultural overflow and currently Northampton is making that problem worse with this land that we are specifically talking about. The ground beneath the agricultural crops in the meadows is dead. Nothing grows underneath the corn and the potatoes. There is just a skim of mildew and mold on the ground beneath the corn and a few straggling, struggling things trying to survive. There is no wildflower habitat in the entire section of the meadows by the airport. The city employees, that is the, North Ham the city of Northampton, mow all of the borders along the roadsides and this year they mowed them at peak migration season for our pollinators. I have photos of that, which I will submit for the record. In conclusion, the current use of the meadows for industrial agriculture pollutes our local and global environment and in no way deserves to be protected in its current form of use. The siting of solar PV on this prime agricultural land will in no way alter its future viability for farmland once we no longer need solar panels, but we must transition to a clean energy economy and we must not look elsewhere for our energy to come from. We must look in our own community. The land would be well served to be rested. This land has been continuously farmed since 1660. It has been used for all of its nutrients. And as was mentioned, the damming of the rivers has stopped the flooding. We now add nutrients chemically to this land and the overflow goes directly into our oceans. A mixed use of the meadows for growing of locally consumed crops in combination with wildflower meadows for pollinators and solar PV to meet our growing needs for electricity to power our next generation of transportation in this city can't really come from anywhere else. We don't have a better option. And we can manage the land much better. And that soil after 25 years, let's say, of having solar PV and wildflowers on it will be much richer for that rest that we can give it. So we are not talking about destroying agricultural land. We are not talking about building skyscrapers on agricultural land. We are talking about putting down renewable energy to transform our community into one 
which is carbon neutral. And that is our job on this commission. And so there is no way that I can possibly support the continued use of that land for industrial agriculture, which causes a tremendous amount of pollution. And I find it unfathomable that we would stop PV production from happening on this land, which is crucial to our successful transition away from fossil fuels. Thank you. Thanks, Gordon. Um, I don't want to get, because we have a lot of things in the agenda tonight, which we need to make decisions on, and there's nothing specifically pending, I don't want to get a long debate on this, but I also, does anybody have any quick information to add before I move on? And then obviously we can reopen the debate if we actually have a proposal before us. Rachel? Oh, Go ahead, Rachel. Internet problems. Yes. Yeah. Could, um, I, my internet is unstable, but perhaps could we recognize Fred if Fred would like to, to say a few words? That was sure. a long statement. Yeah. Fred, I muted Sorry, you. Sorry, internet. So you have to unmute yourself. Okay. Yep. Well, Gordon, I appreciate your comments. And um, I am an organic farmer. I have worked on both organic and non-organic farms. The farm I'm currently farming, Pie in the Sky Berry Farm, was uh, chemically farmed, as you would say, until I bought it. But the rebound of that land has been incredible. And I can only say that of my piece, if you'd like to take a walk with me, I'll show you more pollinator habitat, more earthworms, more fertility than you could dream of. So it's out there and this land is not, you know, the incredible thing about the meadows, which makes it such an important ag agricultural resource is that as you say, this land has been used and used hard for hundreds, actually for a thousand years. And it still is producing insane amounts of the crops that we all need. You know, I eat French fries, Got to grow potatoes somewhere. And the, I would say that the corn and the potatoes that are grown there, I very much doubt that they're being shipped very far because this is not a, you know, this is not an export region. I know that Chip Parsons, for example, he grows corn. Like if you're going down Route 5 and there's, you pass the medical complex there and there's that the hot dog stand on the right, there's a patch of corn right there. It's, I think it's 40 acres. He has just the best pig raising operation in the Pioneer Valley. And the reason it's the best is that you don't even know it exists. He raises hundreds of pigs in Hadley in a, in a way that is, has no community impact and is the kind of scale of operation that is not industrial hog farming in places like North Carolina, where they actually literally shoot hog cannons of shit from the lagoons up in the air before hurricanes come to disperse it so that they have room in their shit lagoons for more shit. So this is actually not industrial agriculture on that scale. It is highly productive though. And in terms of, you know, enhancing it for pollinators and other uses, if the incentives were there, I'm sure that most landowners would do it. Those are incentives that really have not been placed in a financial way in front of the farmers. But I would say that the farmers that I know and that I see out there are great farmers. They do a great job. They do as good a job as anybody in the world. And, you know, for me to be an organic farmer for 24 years and to compliment chemical farmers, I know that sounds like weird bedfellows, but you know, we need food and it's a way that has worked for those people. And you know, I have my hats off to the Swazlowski's and Allard Farm and those people and the job that they do. But you know, I do think this is a great conversation to have in terms of what sustainability means in terms of agriculture and the Ag Commission itself would be a great place for you to come and debate these things and talk to some of the farmers and you know voice your opinions because i'm sure that they would not they wouldn't be happy to hear so much anger and concern about their farming practices but they do everything they do is i believe is legal under you know agricultural rules in the state so it's not like they're doing anything they're not there's not like midnight dumping so yeah, and, and I can appreciate that. And I would love to come and visit your farm. I have a small farm myself. Um, I can only speak to what I personally see down in our land around the airport. And I spend 
uh, about half an hour down there literally every single day. And I see uh, land which is completely depraved of food sources for any insects. Uh, there's very little bird life down there. Uh, you know, the hunters go down there, but they're shooting pheasants that are raised on farms like chickens. You know, there, there really isn't significant habitat down there. Uh, and and the, there's no riparian border in large sections of the meadow, which is very dangerous and they're losing a lot of ground from it. So I think that this is a really big and important debate for us to all have. Uh, and I genuinely appreciate your position, Fred. Um, I, I'm, I'm uh, posing a different position, uh, but I think that it's a, it's a conversation that really needs to be had. We have to produce energy here in order to be sustainable. And we cannot cut that land off without having specific debates over specific projects before they possibly come to pass. And, and the, the ownership of that land is really amongst very limited hands. And as you say, it goes back to the 1660s when the people who were given the land were given it in exchange for massacring the native people here. And our continuing to protect that land for some of these families who have passed it down since then is only contributing to a terrible system of inequality uh, which, which really uh, is unfortunate for us to support. So I, I need to move us along. Ben, you get last word, but just a few seconds. Yeah, it's about moving us along. Um, and, and I'd like to say, I think this is a, a worthwhile subject um, that we should put on the agenda in a form in which we can think about how the agricultural land or, or this land, which can have a bunch of functions, how we should value it, uh, where we have levers and where we don't to offer incentives or not, and to think about different farming practices, uh, including uh, um, regenerative farming, which could have a higher value towards the carbon question that we're talking about, which has not been addressed particularly in, in this, this discussion. So I don't want to discuss it now. I'm just saying it's a valid thing for us to put on our agenda and to think about where we actually have levers. Sounds good. Again, because there's no action before us, we're not in a hurry for this piece. Right. Um, all right, so let me go back to the agenda. So the next thing, the item is the, the minutes you, of September 23rd. Thanks, Fred. Um, does anybody want to make a motion to approve the minutes? I'll move. Second. Okay, so Second. Move Second. All right, any discussion? All right, as you know, if you were all- Actually, up. hang on, I'm sorry. Uh, I just wanted to ask, I, I, I didn't get a chance to take a look through the minutes too thoroughly. Did it mention that we had directly talked about uh, having a session to discuss our changing of our agenda format in this meeting? Because I would hope that it had mentioned that we had discussed that. And yeah, I just wanted to state for the record that I requested that that be a part of this meeting and that was refused by our chairman. So I wanted to tell everyone on the commission as well as the public uh, that that agenda item was refused. Uh, and this is not the first time that I have been refused agenda items by our chair. And it is behavior which I find to be deeply disturbing. Okay, thanks, Gordon. Any other comments? Okay, and a call of vote. Um, so Ben? Yes. Rich? Yes. Ashley? Yes, okay. Yes. Gordon? I abstain. Okay, Rachel? Yes. Alex? Yes. David? Yes. And Wayne, yes. Okay. And okay. Louis, Louis abstains. For oh, job. okay, sorry. Um, go, go. Wayne, really quickly, I just missed who um, moved and seconded that. I seconded it. No, and, David, no and David, did you move it? For a minute. Yeah, okay, thanks. All right, so one of the things that did come up at the, the retreat was just sort of at everyone asking, you know, can we figure out a feedback loop so that after you all make recommendations, 
we can sort of get back to you at future meetings and say, you know, what happened to each of those items. So you can see the sort of, you know, this is a very simple tracking sheet is what's up on the, the screen. Um, and so what we're do at the end of each meeting is we say, you know, what were the recommendations? You know, this, is, this isn't to cover them all, but just a quick summary. And then what's the follow up? Um, and whether we do it from uh, sort of now going forward or try to go back in time, I guess, I, you know, I'm open to whatever works in that process. It's obviously easier to do it now as opposed to sort of going through all of our middens. But um, so just so you know, so for now we'll be, you know, following through in that, that process. Um, all right, so with that, so that's, you know, just you know the, the notes we're keeping. So the other thing that came out of the um, retreat is yes, we want to do a follow-up meeting, but people also said they want to make sure that they're involved early on before decisions are made. So the timing for the retreat, because it's it's sort of like the meadows, important conversation, but not time critical. So we're come back to the retreat, but things that have deadlines for your input are always going to go first because we didn't meet last, last week. There's a lot of those things. So um, the first one on the agenda is um, if you remember one of the, the recommendations in the uh, climate resilience and regeneration plan is to bring climate protection into the capital improvements program. We had a very short window to um, for this year. So, you know, we're currently fiscal years are the year that the, the fiscal year ends. So we're currently in FY22, which is the fiscal year that begins July 1st. The mayor's office is now taking request or was taking requests that I think a time limit's passed for FY23, which is the year that begins on July 1st. There's not time to do sort of a full discussion. So we're really talking about what happens in FY24, right? So we're a quarter of the way through the time period. We want to be carbon neutral for city operations. So in that short time, we put language in the capital improvements program to partially inform the process um, for the capital improvements committee members, for the mayor, and then when it comes to city council, it is very much a um, qualitative process to begin it. And we're, you know, have already heard, frankly, pushback from department heads about they don't know how to do this information. I haven't done a debrief because they've only started meeting. With, I'm sorry, Wayne, um, can you just zoom in for us so that I, I can't read it? It's oh, I'm sorry, yeah. Small. Okay. Thank you. Um, so, you know, so some pushback from department heads, we don't frankly know how much the capital improvements committee is really going to use this in the first place. But nonetheless, we want to already start thinking about next year and make it more, um, you know, robust. We got a small grant from PVPC, Pine Valley Planning Commission, which is mostly just staff time, to engage city staff and finance director and look at other models that are out there so we can learn from other models. So we're going through the conversation, Chris and I and Charlene, who's the city's finance director, are involved in that conversation. Um, so we want to bring you into the conversation for the counselors in particular, you know, to think about as capital improvements requests come before council. You may or may not want to ask questions about to what extent did this process inform what comes before council. And for you all to think about what do we do next year? Um, I emailed this out to you in your package. We don't, this isn't something we didn't answer today. We're meeting with PVPC next week or the week after, I forgot which, but it's not like any, it's not like it's a deadline. So if you can give us feedback today, that's great. If you can't, we can bring this back before you. Um, so I just walk through this very quickly. You know, the first part is just the introduction, this thing is yellow. Um, and then again, this is the part that's uh, qualitative. You know, how do you advance climate resilience? And then the, basically the same thing later on how do you enhance climate regeneration? Um, and I don't really have anything beyond that. We're sort of looking for how do we make this palatable to department heads and to citizen members to do this? So um, let me just, sorry, I didn't notice. Who raised your hand first, Gordon or Ben? Ben. Ben, okay, go for it. I, first of all, I just I want to say I think this is great. Like this is a great start, and um, I'm really pleased to see kind of the beginning of actually operationalizing the stuff we've been talking about and caring about for a while. So you know, 
kudos to uh, to wh whoever <laughs> was behind putting this together. Um, and I think that the pushback that you described is totally reasonable. Uh, in other words, if if my expertise is in um, you know I, I don't know road maintenance or something. I don't necessarily know how to answer these questions with any level of reliability. Um, and so I think we need to think of a way to provide that expertise to the department heads or to whoever is, is uh, filling this form out, whoever is figuring this out, uh, needs access to, to expertise, better information, guidance. This is a great opportunity, right, to actually teach people how to think about these questions in their own specialized field where they maybe haven't been trained on that yet. So, um, so to me, this, you know, provided that there's support rather than just an expectation, uh, this could be incredibly useful. And I realized that you've written right in there, the purpose of the exercise is to get a qualitative understanding of a general direction, but at some point it would be good to turn this into something uh, it can still be qualitative but you know provide some sort of scale uh, ranking of something some some way to actually weight how we as a community value the answers and how they actually result in decisions um, but to me this is a great start thanks Gordon uh, yeah what I mean one thing that I noticed on that was that it was asking questions about projects that are currently happening in a way that kind of seemed to make it so that the person looking at it would have to find a way to explain their existing project that they were doing uh, and come up with some way that that project was good for sustainability as opposed to thinking about sustainability first and then coming up with projects to enhance sustainability. Um, and it seems like the way that it's written now, it's just kind of like, well, hammer your square peg into the round hole and, and tell us that it's actually sustainable so that we can check a box saying that we said it's sustainable. Um, as opposed to asking department heads to take a look around and propose what projects they might like to do that they think would be sustainable and explain why, so that those I, so that we're kind of getting everyone's minds working on the problem. I think that the more people that we're asking to think about this. Uh, within their own department and, and propose things that could be done or incorporated into their capital plan that would be specifically for sustainability might be more productive than asking them simply to explain how their existing ideas are sustainable so that we can say they are. Great, thanks Gordon. Other comments? Ashley. Yeah, I, I would echo Ben that I think this is a really great start. Um, it's making me think of the equity frameworks I've been reading a lot lately uh, and just sort of these frameworks that exist to help you think about building equity into a program or project from the beginning and really participatory engagement. And I think there are a couple of things that could be applied here. One makes me wonder like, this should probably be a like climate resilience and equity questionnaire. Uh, maybe sort of being, I think that's somewhat folded into resilience, but um, I think as a city we've committed to, to um, equity and I, I think building it in here would be worthwhile. Um, and the other thing I see in those frameworks are just more prompts, more questions. So I think we could flesh this out to provide more support to departments that, you know, for each of these bullets, then have like questions to consider, blah, 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 um, to help get more like substantive answers. And I, I would say to your point, Gordon, 
I think if this is done early enough, it's not necessarily like performative checking a box. It's really opening people's minds and getting them to think, oh, well, what dimension could I add to the project or how could I tweak it so that it is more in pursuit of climate or justice? Um, could we maybe solve that by changing maybe like the way that it's phrased uh, in the questionnaire, like uh, saying uh, how, uh, or saying something like, do you feel that this project is the most sustainable way of do, you know, that you're, or do you feel that you're proposing to do this in the most sustainable way? Is there a way in which you could make this more environment, environmental friendly, uh, making it more of an open-ended question to force people to think about it as opposed to giving, simply giving them an opportunity to say, uh, yes, it is sustainable. You see what I'm saying? And, and let me add, so I was the one, so we started this process in July or June actually to apply for the PDPC funds. But when Charlene said the deadline for putting the, this thing out to department heads, I was the one who wrote this in just a couple hours. So, you know, it, it was a very fast thing. But two things for this conversation to think about. One is no matter what the questions are, it's not really gonna motivate department heads until there's a real reward for doing the right thing. So department heads, you know, we all know how to get money, right? That's what we get paid for. So it, when someone's request gets denied because it's not moving the dial and someone else's request gets approved because it is moving the dial, every department head is gonna take notice and it's gonna start doing real things. So I think, and so that's going to require, in essence, the new mayor. And that's why I was pointing, pointing looking at the council. That's going to require saying, yeah, this can't just be what Gordon said. It can't just be a, a round hole in the square peg or vice versa. It has to be really mean something. And maybe it's not this year, but later. Um, and then the other combination that really struck me is while we were working on this, the city's ladder truck fell apart and city council in sort of emergency had to approve $1.1 million for new ladder truck which if I had been counsel, I would absolutely vote for it. This is not critical whatsoever. We, we need a ladder truck, but it did make me think, so how do we have that conversation? You know, you know, does the fire chief say, I looked and couldn't find an electric ladder truck, doesn't exist. Does the fire chief say, instead of 1.1 million, give me 1.2 million, I'm gonna spend $100,000 restoring wetlands or putting solar panels up as an offset. So there are projects like Gordon's focus on things that are specifically sustainability. And then there's projects that, like a fire truck, we desperately need, and we just need to think about the offsets for doing it. Uh, Rachel, you have to unmute yourself. Yeah, yeah uh, welcome to my world, Wayne. <laughs> 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 yeah, I mean, it's really tricky with the kind of, especially, you know, uh, fire rescue, we've seen that with policing, you know, it's, it's kind of, um, it's really hard to turn those down, but I, I, it, it did give me pause at how much, you know, how much we're investing and um, yeah, this is a 20 year ladder. And yeah, I, I think um, that's, I'm glad you brought that up. I was just gonna uh, echo, I, I'm so glad Ashley mentioned equity. I think that's that's a great, you know, that that's, should definitely be integrated here because as the climate crisis unfolds more, it's gonna become more and more clear the disparities. And so I think that just has to be there. And just a, you know, a little plug for climate also meaning, you know, our, our, our city lighting um, lighting should be included in in capital, you know, in vetting capital improvement projects. I think you know, lighting, um, excessive lighting, um, trying to avoid excessive lighting. And I, you, you, I'm going to give some thought to what you're saying, yeah, you know, Gordon and Wayne, about how to make this not like a rubber stamp thing. And is it should it be housed, uh, you know, in city services or you know somewhere in council where you know it, it really makes we make sure it gets. Um, it's proper due. I just don't know the answer, but I'm going to think about that because I see the perils. Thank you. And, and let me just add one thing. If you look at some of the leaders in capital improvements, so Brookline in Massachusetts, you know, Ann Arbor, lots of lots of places around the country, who do an incredible job of tying their planning together, capital improvements, much better than we do, frankly. It's because they're all rich. And they get yeah. some luxury, right? You need to buy a fire truck. I'm not arguing against that whatsoever. And the problem is often after we pay for things we need, there's no money left, we're done. So the, the Brooklines can do a better job because there's a few million dollars left. 
to do what, what they want for doing it. So I, I do understand that stress in a middle income community. Gordon. I would point out that there was a commissioner that came before this commission that suggested a way of financing energy improvements at no cost. I would just Thanks. remind you. Yeah. yeah. And <laughs> okay. we haven't continued that conversation and we should. Okay. Ben. Uh, so I think this tool, if again, if this tool can be kind of expanded and have some increased quantification to it would allow you to actually not stress about the, the ladder truck, right? So in other words, how much diesel does that one ladder truck actually burn each year yep. compared to some other choice? And then you can compare things and you look at and you say, you know, we shouldn't spend a whole lot of money on a battery electric ladder truck because it won't change our emissions that much compared to this other project where it makes a really big difference. So having this in there actually makes your decision easier in some cases, because you can not fret about certain ones and pay more attention to other ones. Good point. Anything, so, so um, we take this back to this conversation we're having um, with PVPC and with the finance director, and then if it's okay for people for you know, the next meeting after, because again, this is an iterative process we have, you know, basically until next August to get to finish this, but we want to keep building along because these could potentially be really complicated. And particularly if we do something following Ben's first discussion about what what's the level of support would be, right? If, if a department head, you know, who done nothing about this stuff needs support, what does that look like? Any last thoughts on this? Chris. Yeah, Wayne. Um, yeah, just um, towards um people's comments uh you know if, the more you can plan ahead the more you can put it in so right now um uh every request for a new vehicle is coming through me and um i'm trying to help every department to figure out whether or not it can be an electric vehicle um and then you know both pricing it out and well do we have an electric vehicle that can actually serve that uh, function um and then there's the uh, capital improvement planning studies that we've been doing on different facilities. At the moment, just seven uh, city buildings, kind of small. We're moving on to three schools this year, three, three more schools next year. Those are all in the capital improvement planning process. And we've kind of sprinkled throughout there, not knowing exactly what we're gonna be doing, but we've sprinkled throughout the next five years, um, uh, money for both design studies to get into the, you know, the detailed studies that we need, and then um, uh, $500,000 at a pop for different schools um, aimed probably on energy recovery ventilation and air source heat pumps, but yet to be seen as we, um, as we you know, define them more because we haven't done, done the studies. But we're already starting to populate the capital improvement planning process going forward. We're going to need this money. We're going to need pieces of it. And it's not going to be enough what we're putting in yet, but we're just starting to fill it in as we do the long-term planning. Thank you. And I'll add to that that on the resilience side, so Chris is on the mitigation regeneration, on the resilience side, both DPW and planning this year have several applications can, in the capital improvements request. That, Wayne and Chris, that, can you tell me how much we've budgeted to do all of those engineering investigations of those buildings to prepare for any capital improvement planning? I um, can't say what we're, we've budgeted because at the moment, the capital improvement planning, we're um, it's a it covers five years and we have requests in for many of those years going forward but only one year at a time is approved and budgeted okay. so it's, it, it's not until it actually goes through the process and gets approved by city council that we actually have a budget so at this point i feel like it's my responsibility to uh let Councillor Jarrett and Councillor myra moira pardon me for mispronouncing your name rachel um that there are budget neutral options for investigating the needs of all of our buildings. There are free ways to do all of this investigative work that Chris and Wayne are suggesting that we do. And I would remind all of our department heads here that your budgets are being used to do these engineering studies 
And if we were to engage with an energy service company in exploring an energy savings performance contract, they would do all of this investigative work for us for free, zero dollars. And I have been saying that for a couple of years now, and it has been falling on deaf ears, and I do not understand why. There is an established mechanism for investigating all of our buildings for free, and it will give us an entire list with the exact paybacks of all of the measures that we can do citywide we can have them order that list from most cost-effective to least, and then they will finance doing the work on a 25-year note, and we have good credit. At this point, we could borrow that money for almost free, and we could get an enormous, I am talking tens of millions of dollars of work done for this city without any cost. And I do not understand why we have not pushed forward with looking into this process. And I would urge you on city council to please push the administration to investigate a performance contract so we can do some of this work without it costing our department heads their budgets. Thanks, Gordon. Anything else on this? Well, wait, I'm just wondering if could you give some framework for what Gordon brought up? I'm just so this is, I think, more Chris and, and David's expertise. So I'll have to defer to oh, them. OK. I so just was wondering. Chris has been yeah. through that, that original $6.5 million the council approved 10 years ago was an earlier version. So Chris, do you want to weigh in on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think Gordon's got a point. I mean, it, it is a viable tool. Um, uh, Gordon, I will say that the seven, I don't have the study in front of me that I haven't added everything up, but the, you know, the seven small buildings we're talking about, they identified probably 20 million, $30 million worth of work, um, whether or not, um, you know, in the first study. So, you know, the amount we're spending right now is not that big compared to what it's gonna to take to, to actually accomplish this. Getting our buildings off of fossil fuels is enormous and it's not gonna pay for itself. It's not gonna pay for itself over 25 years. Um, I truly, you know, don't, you maybe, don't maybe know not. that you, you, because you have refused to do the studies and you're paying for studies out of our city's dollars instead of getting it done for free. Well, they don't do it for free unless you're going to get the money back on the back end. That's not really true. Ben. So I, I, I just want to say that, that the ESCO approach can work, um, but you, you get what they want you to get instead of necessarily, Gordon, just give me, give me a minute instead of necessarily what you want to get. And in this case, we're learning, for instance, the engineering group or the, the, the group that was put together to do these, these studies um, are not your typical uh, kind of energy systems engineers who, who kind of look at, at buildings in a very narrow way that ESCOs do. And so they pointed up structural issues, uh, redesign issues, use issues. This is a much more holistic approach to understanding these particular buildings, which was Chris's purpose was to understand these, these buildings and to be able to plan for the long term where we might want to invest and, and what things are going to cost. In no case, especially with natural gas being really, really cheap, and even right now it's it's rising a little bit, but it's still you know, it's still cheap. It's very hard for any of these things to pay for themselves, except for these incremental changes where the opportunity presents. And those are the opportunities the ESCOs look for. But that doesn't get you to the target that 
I think Chris is and in the city are aiming for. Mm -hmm. And that's that's the challenge with this kind of contract. But it certainly gives you a list of things that technically can be done and exactly what their paybacks are. And what you get is a function of how well you manage that ESCO. And so if they cannot do anything that you do not sign off on them doing, so to suggest that you have no control, I would say is wrong, but I do understand your point that they like to take the low hanging fruit. That is certainly typical. The low hanging fruit is gone now. It is a way for us to get immense amounts of information put into, uh, it put into our hands, enormous amounts of information. And even if they are only able to do a small amount, at least they are able to do that and give us a roadmap for the energy systems of our buildings for us to push forward with, uh, with our own budget uh, where we need to. Like I said, I don't, I don't object to, sure, inviting them in, spend, spend some time, see what they see. I'm just saying I've, I've encountered enough of their output to know that they don't take holistic views of buildings. It's not their job. It's not how they look at things. So you're right, they'll deliver a list and they'll prioritize that list but they won't work on how these items work together. And if you look at what the group that Chris uh, hired, you know, the, the, the consulting group, what they delivered is not just a list, it's how these, these components combine to allow you to move forward. And then you're able to prioritize uh, with these particular buildings, what you can do so that you're ready when the investment that the ESCO would never make is available. Well, I went to one of those meetings and the resounding takeaway I had was that they suggested all kinds of things that needed to be done. And Chris said, we can't afford that. And that was pretty much where that went. So I don't see the purpose of going through that exercise if we're just going to tell them, oh, that's very nice, but there's no way of us actually getting the work done. We're going to have to find ways to finance the improvements that we need to make. And using energy savings is a good one. And there's going to be a huge shift, as you well know, in the way that we consume energy, since right now, the vast majority of the energy that is consumed in this city is fossil fuels, if we, especially if we consider transportation. And over the next 10 years, as we shift our transportation energy consumption from fossil fuels, to the electric grid, we are going to have a massive shift uh, in, in the way that we're all spending money on utilities. And we need to really start thinking about that big picture, what we're going to do about it. You know, our utility grid as it stands now is completely incorrectly configured for delivering us the, the fuel of the future. So we really, and that goes back to the conversation about the meadows. You know, we're going to be consuming an enormous amount more electricity. We've got to, we've got to do something about it. I apologize for getting off topic. Yeah, no, 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 no disagreement there. All right, I'm going to keep moving us along to, to follow the agenda, um, and we can talk about whether we. So it does bring up one other thing, though, um, just sort of related. So you know, I showed you this tracking sheet before. Um, and so one of the questions is, are we only tracking things that the commission shows by consensus they want to do, or do we also track things that are individual people? So, you know, Gordon has certainly been talking about ESCO for a long time, but we've never had a formal commission support. Should I track that? You don't have to tell me now, but just sort of keep that in the back of your mind. Of, you know, what is the purpose of this, this tracking sheet? We, you know, we pledge the retreat to make sure you get the follow-up in the conversation. So my gut is we, we follow up on everything whether it's a full commission or not, but just so you know that. Gordon. I apologize. Um, I would just ask that, um, yes, but the way that I would really like to pose it to the commission is that we track alternative methods of fi financing sustainability efforts. ESCOs are a tool within that quiver. Ultimately, these are financial arrangements that we need to be working out. And, and so, um, tracking third-party financed 
sustainability efforts. There are uh, ESPCs, which is directly through the ESCOs. There are UESCs, which is a utility energy savings contract, which the utility company does on-bill financing of projects. Those also go through ESCOs just for everyone's information. And uh, there's also PACE financing, which is something that we've not really discussed at all within this commission, but certainly I think falls within our purview. Does anybody know what PACE financing is? We have discussed it. Northampton was one of the first adopters and we had a presentation from Mass Development before this commission a okay, few months excellent. ago. Excellent. So there are multiple types of third-party financing. I really think it's going to be an important thing for us to be discussing on how we're actually going to pay for, for energy improvements. We don't have to come up with all of it out of our budget directly. Okay, thanks. Um, last thing is while we're on things that came directly out of Resilience Regeneration Plan, I think you're all on our planning listserv, but just in case you aren't. So one of the things we pledged when we did the Resilience Regeneration Plan was it was a standalone plan for a while. We wanted to merge it into the overall comprehensive plan. We just received a $75,000 grant that's paying for both sort of just the InDesign work. It's, this is not substantive, but the InDesign work of merging, you know, more complicated than you think is switching from portrait mode to, to landscape mode type thing, but merging them together, getting rid of duplicates, which makes it more accessible and readable. And then we want to do a story map, basically, you know, sort of make it much more accessible to the public. So we're going to be moving on that. If you're interested, November 18th, is the planning board public here. Again, these are non-substantive changes. The main goal is to make it more understandable for the public for future substantive changes. But, um, so next thing on the, the agenda I wanna share is the, um, again, this sort of fits in the follow-up piece, but just wanted to give you one more crack at it. If you remember, we came before you when we first started writing the zoning for um, EV charging stations. There's a whole debate, you know, Ben saying, hey, I have an electric car. I don't need to charge as often because I have a 300 mile range, but we don't you know apartment dwellers do. Um, so you all supported the original language. I think I forgot exactly how you voted, but the original language was conduit for 15 stations. So you could have 15 stations, but actually build 25 stations. When it went to public hearing, planning board said, look, we want these people are gonna keep going, particularly from an equity standpoint, where lots of people don't have electric chargers in their apartments. If we're gonna make them do conduit, let's just make them do a station. So the current draft that goes back before council um, is one EV charger per 15 space. Um, so I just wanna bring it before you see, do you wanna support that, oppose that, give feedback? Alex. Uh, first, I think there's a Scrivener's error. It says lots larger than 75 spaces at the top there, but that should be 25. Or that that's what actually came out of council was 25. Yeah. Yep. Um, right. And then um, I'm curious why I haven't heard yet why the um, the planning board decided to reduce it. Um, it sounds good to me because there will, there will be more of them. Um, but was there some do you do you know the thinking there? Yeah, I wasn't at the meeting, so this is sort of secondhand, so yeah, I can check with Carol in more detail, but I think three things. One is, hey, if we're making people do conduit anyway, that's at least a portion of the cost. Second is EVs are going to just grow, and, and so we're going to need more and more. Um, but third was the equity piece, that yes, those of us who live in single-family homes or condos with EV chargers probably don't need it when they're going out, but lots of apartment dwellers, lots of people don't have that access to chargers. And so let, let's keep doing more if we're doing it. Um, and even though these are very expensive when we retrofit, with if we throw these into the construction of a parking lot as a percentage of the overall, because when, when zoning is only proactive, those you don't know. We don't get anything about existing lots. You know, the city could invest in our lots, private sector can, people can, but when we're building a new lot, this is still a relatively small percentage of it. This zoning does apply to both public and private. And um, so is there data about the recommendations and recommendations going forward for like best practices for numbers? And does, is this in line with that? We couldn't find anything. It may be, Chris raised their hands, so I'll call on him, but that we sort of felt like, frankly, we we're making a number out of thin air. We didn't see any set numbers out there. 
Yeah, I haven't seen set numbers either, but I have um, recently started looking since we've been putting in charge point chargers, <clears throat> I now have data that we've been tracking. And I found something rather fascinating. We've had, for a long time, we've had two, um, two ports or big, two parking places in the parking garage. And a couple of years ago, we added a second one. So we had now had four spaces. And I found it odd that the second one we put in suddenly became more at a higher use than the first one. Um, we also have some in other parking lots around. So different one, you know, so it's, it's almost as if it was telling me the garage with four spaces at the moment is maxed out because one of them is not being used very much. And for some odd reason, they like those two parts, you know, they, they like the two new parking spaces better than they like the old parking spaces that we did. I don't know why, do. but it, it kind of landed that, but there isn't really any, that's anecdotal evidence. There's no real good evidence. I'd love to have evidence, you know, someone's McKenzie report or something on what is going to be the ramp up speed of EVs and how fast are we going to need charging stations? I, I'm telling you why not, not to use your data about those two chargers, because one of them, the original one, okay, um, about half the time, it doesn't connect. So it's, it's a frustration with this particular machine. <laughs> It does like you put your uh, you, you that's put your good phone to know, and it doesn't connect, so you can't actually get your thing charging. So, fortunately, you have plenty of batteries, you go park somewhere else in the garage if someone is taking up the charging spaces. So, it's not about lack of demand, it's about a malfunctioning a piece of equipment that doesn't connect all the time. Very good, very good. Great to know that, Ben. Thanks. Send us a work order on that, Ben. <laughs> Uh, Gordon. Oh, I was just going to ask what the you're you're saying this the second set that was put in was much more popular. Is that the ones that are uh, right next to City Hall on on whatever street that is? No, I'm, I was talking about the, um, this was just in the parking garage. So we're oh, talking just about all the same location. Okay. All right. Yeah, I was just wondering if it was a visibility right. issue. Do you find that the ones on the street are, how do you find those uh, to be in use proportional to the ones that are in the garage? Do they get used more or less? So I'm kind of curious about that because they're in such a high visibility spot on the street in front of provisions. You're talking about the ones on, you're talking about the one on, yeah, right across from provisions. Those unfortunately are the old fashioned ones. We don't have data for those. Okay. So the, um, the most recent grant is gonna actually replace that with one that we will have a data plan for. So okay. cool. at the moment, I can't tell you. So I'm not hearing any outcry to make recommendations, which is fine. It's just go with planning board's recommendation, but do, do we want to weigh in before this goes to council? Actually, I have one more thing just to, yeah, and then I'm gonna let you go because it's, I'm actually just gonna say something you said at a previous meeting. Maybe you're gonna say it again. Well, so I don't, so 75 spaces is a lot of spaces. And if we're really concerned with equity, it doesn't do you much good if you have to park your car far away from where your actual apartment is and then walk, you know, like, then why do you have a, a car, you know? So if, I don't know the answer, but if there was some way to figure out how to get chargers in residential areas where people don't have driveways or garages or where there's, you know, to, to associate them, with places near where people actually live and might park an electric car, but don't have, you know, the 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 charger at home. That's where where we have an impact on equity. I just I suspect if there's a 75 lot parking space, do I have the time to leave my car there to charge it long enough? If we're gonna do that, we really need to make them uh, rapid chargers. So you know, and just. One thing to go back to what Alex is saying with Scribner's error. So the language up top that says 75 spaces is the section where we were inserting this. So that's why it is 75. But when the number was changed to this applies to any addition of 25 or more spaces, that's what we're talking about. So, we, so that's why Alex is saying it's a Scribner's error because yes, this now, if this passed, this would apply to lots that are the new lots that are 25 spaces or more or addition of 25. Which seems like something you might find around a new development or new. Uh, so in that case, yes, it's it's appropriate. Yep. 
I mean, not tiny condo projects or homes, but any no. substantial condo projects. Yeah. yeah, no, that then it makes sense. Okay. Gordon. Ben, are you suggesting that it would be something for us to like start thinking about how to incentivize putting it in, um, say, like multifamily units or something? Or we're talking about equity. Yeah. Most of our uh, lower income residents live in multifamily housing. Um, maybe it would be something for us to really start thinking about how we could incentivize uh, putting uh, chargers into multifamily housing, um, you know, because the landlords are unlikely to be able to afford to do it mm -hmm. uh, just as a perk to their tenants, but it would certainly be of great value to the city to be able to have all of its lower income residents have chargers available. Another issue I don't know how to solve, but just to flag it, is that the demand charges on this can be insane. And so depending on who's That's paying the bills. So pardon me? It's, it's not as much of a problem for us because we're a national grid. It's a horrible problem for anybody in every resource territory. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, so, so right. it's actually not, yeah. So I want to move so along. What I'm hearing, just nod your heads from the smiles and nodding heads. I'm hearing people are okay with the zoning, which is the thing that's immediately before us, but that we should think, and that's the only thing that's formally before us, but we should also think about, you know, future investments in EV chargers for affordable housing um, projects, which wouldn't be a zoning, but it'd be an investment strategy. Chris. Yeah, I just thought I'd kind of broaden that. I, I think it's I think affordable housing is one good one, but just where do we want EV chargers? Where's the best place for EV charge throughout? So that I think that would be just a really good exercise to go through. And it'd be a good one for us to kind of put on our little tracking list um, so that we know where we're trying to aim. And then we got to figure out the policy, how to actually get them there. Mm -hmm. But the first thing okay. is to figure out where do we actually want the chargers broadly. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's okay, I can say that's a consensus, the board, no one objects to that approach. All right, so let me move on to the next thing. Um, again, you have this in your package, this is hard to see your screen. But so we have an ad hoc policy that's worked with the current mayor on thinking about, so, so you all, let me go step back. You all know, because you all supported that we adopted a series of zoning changes recently that are in return for giving incentives requiring um, you know, fossil fuel free buildings and in some cases higher energy performance. Separate from zoning, um, we sometimes give away city property. We have I think eight different parcels of land which we're working on, the city council surplus we're working on. And we use a series of funding sources, most often CPA and CDBG funds um, to support affordable housing, but we also use Housing Choice and, and Mass Development and some other sources. Sorry about that. Um, and, and the mayor, the current mayor, has been very supportive about doing conditions. So this happens to be the one on the screen is we're donating a parcel of land on Laurel Street, which the state legislature gave to the city. City Council then allowed us to surplus it. We're giving it to Valley CEC. It's going to be for 20 affordable units. Um, and the condition on that was they're still working. We, we need some flexibility because they're doing their due diligence. But the condition on that is, um, you know, all the, the interior loads, heating, cooling, hot water would be um, not, you know, would be basically electric. I mean, I suppose you could do other things, but it, it wouldn't be uh, fossil fuels and some kind of high performance standards. You know, those things are working like, you know, passive house, but probably not passive house certified. That, kind of thing. Um, so that happens to be the current thing for this 20 unit project. When we give projects to Habitat for Humanity, we're usually a little bit less aggressive because they're doing smaller units, but we still say fossil fuel free. We still say net energy zero ready. Um, and we do have a provision for waiving some replacement trees to create, to allow solar panels on, on buildings. So the question to really start, we don't need to reach a final conclusion today is, does this process work just sort of informally? Because we need some flexibility because each project's a little different, right? You know, the 53 units at 140 Olander Drive, passive house construction, 
all heat pumps for heating and cooling, but they felt like they, didn't, they weren't ready for prime time for hot water, so they're still using a massive propane tank for hot water. So different pieces. So the question is, do we want to have a more formal policy? Ben's been helpful, frankly, for the brainstorming part of this, but should we move this to a more formal policy or is this ad hoc approach? Uh, Gordon. Um, just in reading number four, I think that there's a loophole that we should close where it says and or grid delivered electricity. Um, and I think that right there, we need to insert uh, grid delivered electricity uh, produced by renewable sources. So uh, in, uh, you know, in purchasing power off of the grid, you can generally uh, pay specifically to get your power from a renewable source. Uh, so I think that uh, in the spirit of what we're trying to do here, we need to put that in there that if they're getting it from the grid that they are specifically getting, that they are getting it from uh, renewable. Yeah. Uh, ben can probably help yeah. with the language. So the uh, challenge with that, the reason we haven't done that is then we're passing on to low income residents those costs that I think we think, I mean, don't get me wrong, I would be the first one to say this, this, the grid should be 100% renewable, but I don't think when we're doing these optional things, it's fair to make low-income residents pay when everyone isn't, is. Isn't that the developers that are, so the, so you're, you we're talking about in situations where the, the tent, low-income tenant is paying for that. Yeah, I mean, that's. Yeah, for both rental and home ownership, the, the, you know, well, water I mean, is covered by land. We're incentivizing all of this work at at significant cost to the city, uh, I think it would behoove us to, to pay the difference for those residents instead of stripping the, the requirement out. I so mean, one of our challenges, just to, this is two things. One is from a funding standpoint, we can put a lot of money in capital for buildings, but we can't, so at least those two primary sources can't be used in ongoing subsidy, legal for block grant and, and legal for CPA. Um, well, are we talking about subsidizing the developers here? Yep. Well, no, yeah. subsidizing the units. So these are almost all nonprofit developers, and we're sub writing down the cost of them. And the other thing you should know is we, ex we tend to be pennies on the dollar. People come to us for money to prove to other funding sources that it's a real project. But we are typically, there's a few exceptions, you know, uh, homeless shelters. Um, but we are typically less than 10% of the cost of housing. Most people don't come to us, they need real money. They come to us, they have to convince state agencies that the city is putting its capital up there. Okay. Um, I didn't notice the order, Ben, then Adele. Uh, so it, it's just, it, it's always, if you're talking about solar and you mean solar PV, you're gonna be grid connected and when the sun's not shining, you're using electricity from the grid uh, in, in whatever form is coming. So like you can specify all you want, but what you're doing is basically paying an adder to remove a renewable energy credit from the market. That is not what low income people should be doing. Um, what we should be doing is overall improving the grid electrification of the infrastructure enables them to take advantage of a increase, increasingly clean grid as we do it. So that's that part. So I have, I mean, I, I think just simply saying solar thermal, because it's an option that's often not considered. So like if you're doing your and ors, <laughs> you can make solar thermal. Yep. Solar PV, which is going to be grid connected, right? And therefore, at night, it's going to be from the grid. Um, and so that covers where the sources are. Um, and in terms of, of hot water, uh, that's increasingly possible, right? And, and, and actually at, at a lower cost than propane, propane being kind of expensive, um, but you have to design the system well. Um, and, and, you know, so that, by putting that pressure on them to say, no, you, you really need to solve this problem, 
they should go to the designers who tell who give them the solution instead of taking what they believe to the to be the only set of solutions available and just pick from those. Ben, we don't need a, a long technical discussion now, but maybe you can just give yeah. me a quick two cents worth. We had no pushback or no significant pushback from Valley CDC for 20 unit buildings, mm -hmm. but they are gonna be sort of garden style apartments so that there's some land where we had an enormous pushback from TCB for 53 units. Is that about the size or about the agency or about the two years since TCB proposed and Valley proposed? I don't know the answer. Okay. Um, I, yeah, I, I, I don't know the answer there. It could be any, any number of things. So my last comment though was, a concern about that the con conformity to the high efficiency standard, whichever one is selected, is confirmed by the project architect or commissioning agent. I like commissioning agent because that could be somebody who's a third party who has some sort of responsibility towards the city. I don't like architect because they'll fill out a form any damn way they please. <laughs> and, uh, you know, unless, unless there's some sort of third party characteristic to it. That seems there. I mean, one of the comments we heard is passive house commissioning is especially expensive. So, are there independent commissioning agents who aren't passive house? Yeah, yeah, there are. Um, and you know, commissioning is is a well established part of the engineering HVAC profession. So, uh, honestly, it just has to be some sort of third party. Boston, for a very long time, for for very large commercial buildings had a lead equivalent standard so you didn't have to actually get a lead certification but you had to to meet a lead standard and they used lead certifiers but because it didn't have to go through the full process it cost a whole lot less and the re result was mostly pretty good okay thank you yeah. adele there seems to be an important omission from number four in that uh, geothermal is not mentioned. So ground source heat pumps um, are certainly a viable option for larger developments and hopefully for Laurel Street. But isn't that, it seems like it's include powered by solar, wind or grid delivered electricity. I and mean, that's still grid delivered electricity. I mean, it's taking yeah. heat out of the ground, but is that not covered by that? Electricity. Say what? It means it's electricity. Yeah. The, the, your, your, any of these, whether it's an air source heat pump or a ground source heat pump, you're moving heat from one place to another by doing work with electricity. Are you saying therefore that you don't need to specifically mention ground source heat pumps or geothermal? Precisely, because the, the range of technologies is actually much larger than just those two and a good design might combine three different sources and sinks and and combine them through a single heat pump or maybe through four of them. <laughs> and, and so you want the flexibility to have good design and, and good engineering. Great, thanks. Uh, Gordon. Oh, yeah, I, and Ben, certainly correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding uh, from my experience is that we, we were never able to make geothermal pay uh, when you look at the cost of drilling wells versus the savings that it generates, I think that the air source heat pumps have become so much more efficient since geothermal was originally invented that every engineering study that I've ever seen studying the two side by side, we would always go with air source heat pumps as opposed to geothermal uh, because the difference in efficiency was so small that the paybacks never worked to install geothermal. That was my experience with it. Um, and I would just say that, I just wanted to, to back Ben up on the commissioning bit. Um, anything that we're doing, we should make sure that we're instilling a rigorous commissioning I would say, especially with passive houses where you have complicated systems that need to work with each other, I believe. Um, the, when we were doing large projects at my past company for the VA, uh, we would find all kinds of programming errors uh, left in place by the HVAC installers that were caught by the commissioning agents 
and the and fixed before the building ever went into service. And the amount of money that it saves to fix the errors up front is tremendous in comparison to how much it costs. Um, all right, so let me just sort of try to see where I think we are. So I have some specific input on language, which is useful. I think we're gonna draft something for both the mayor to consider for, for block grant and CPC to consider for CPA. So I use his comments. I, once I get a draft, I'll, again, we're not in a desperate hurry. We wanna keep moving this forward. I'm gonna come back to you at either the next meeting or the meeting after and, and ask you to you know, wordsmith that a little bit. I'll try to get that in the package ahead of time so people can come ahead of time. Any last thoughts before we do that? You should also know the other disclaimer right, I need to tell you is we're going to have to, I'm not sure exactly the language, but we're going to have to say when we're doing a relatively large contribution. So, you know, we're, we, I just signed a contract today for a $4,000 first time home buyer grant. We're probably not going to get, we don't have a lot of leverage for a $4,000 grant. So, you know, I'm not sure where the threshold is. Certainly we're giving someone land, so we're giving them, you know, a lot of money, but there's always going to be a bottom threshold. Okay, thank you. That's all very helpful. Um, so next one, which is sort of an outgrowth of this, is you all know that 33 King Street is coming to the city. This is the probate court, or maybe you don't know that. I know the counselors know that. Um, so the probate court hasn't been in use for around two or three years. Um, it was a nightmare to get legislation through, but we have legislation. The property in theory is coming to the city by the end of the year. The state has been unbelievably slow at a bunch of steps. Like we have to do a hazardous waste study and just getting our consultant in the building for a non-invasive study has taken two months. So we'll see how quickly it actually goes, but it's coming to the city. City Council approved, I think just on first reading so far, maybe, oh no, second reading. Um, city Council approved this order. Um, the next two, which basically said property comes to the city, City Council is allowing us to accept the deed, allowing us to surplus the property. Um, there's two check-ins, which the areas that are in yellow, we're gonna be doing a community engagement process. We'll be announcing that in the next couple of weeks and how do we engage different stakeholders in the process. Um, and you, you all are one of the stakeholders. So you're the first stakeholder group we're reaching out to. We'll be reaching out to other committees and community groups and, and the public as a whole, um, asking for input both on ideal uses for the property and conditions for the property. The process is city council has authorized the mayor to surplus it and sell it, but city council wants to approve the final RFP. Um, so not the final user, because we want to make sure users can invest in what could be a six-figure due diligence without worrying about being voted down, but that we have a process they're happy with. So we want to engage you in it. Um, and let me just, this is, uh, sorry, my sharing thing has disappeared. Oh, there it is. Um, so let me you just- You zoom in, Wayne? Yeah, I'm doing it right now. So, um, these are just sort of, you know, we're thinking about th three different standards. Um, and this could be in any number of ways, so two different standards. Um, what, it, what are the things which we wanna require, right? We won't accept an application that doesn't include these. Um, the ones I put in yellow, these are only examples. Don't, you know, we're not going to bank with these things. This is just to begin the conversation. This is from our internal brainstorming. Um, but the problem is we can't necessarily spell out the total in use because we could spend a lot of money and delay the process a year and get no bidders. So we're sort of thinking there's some things we're gonna require for everybody. You, you know, you can't even consider the property unless you do this. And there's some things that, whether we do a point system, but somehow weigh multiple goods, you know, multiple good benefits. Um, so in the minimum standards is what I was thinking about most for this committee, but certainly open to anything. So. You all know we currently own an easement across the property for evening parking, weekend parking, and for access to the bike path. We lose that the moment we take title to the property. It's called merger of interests. So one of the things I'm hoping we do is we don't sell the property without getting that easement back into place. But again, most of that stuff's in the thing. We have a, we have a sewer line that crosses the property. So there's some technical things. Um, 
King Street is pretty narrow at that point. I'm assuming the registry probate court comes down. So it's an opportunity to widen the street and add a tree belt there. Again, those are probably things that are not primarily focus on you. So the three you're thinking about is, again, the same thing we just talked about, fossil fuel free. Um, this is one where we could say ground source heat pump. We're going to lose some bidders, but it's a lot of property there. This, I don't know what it's called, Ben will correct me, but the, the horizontal array as opposed to a vertical well, which takes up more land, but I gather it's less expensive. Um, minimum performance standards of some kind. We can come back to that. EV chargers, you know, maybe even beyond the zoning. But that's really, this is to spark your debate, not to limit your debate. So like to hear your input on both minimum standards and potential weighing of options. And there's nothing magical. I mean, we could say, just, you, you know, we could say we only want to sell this property for a use that expands the tax base, or we only want to sell it for housing. I'm assuming that's not the route we're going. So my assumptions are built into this, but that's not necessarily true. So Chris. Um, yeah, okay, Chris. so just from the ones you put out there, just from the ones you put out there, um, fossil free, uh, space and heating cooling. I think that kind of covers it. I'm not sure if I would point out, I would let it up, leave it up to them how they get there. You know, so ground source heat pump, I wouldn't specify, just leave it up to them. All right. I was thinking only because it's still the highest energy rate, right? I mean, I, you know, I hear what Gordon said that it may be marginal, but, but I'm fine with the fossil fuel free if you all think that's good. Uh, so, so I'd say if you could have fossil fuel free, but also have some sort of maximum heating or cooling EUI. So you know, roughly similar to the concept that's behind Passive House, um, or you could have a minimum HERS index, except that it's not a necessarily a home, you know, it's not a re, not necessarily residential, but kind of use some sort of numeric standard. Otherwise, of course, they could have a fossil fuel heating and heating, which is electric resistance and, uh, you know, window ACs, if, <laughs> if that's what they decided to put in. So, uh, you know, having some sort of maximum EUI seems like a useful uh limit. Ben, can I put you on the spot and get free consulting from you and ask you to sort of think about what that language might actually be and email that to me? Because that stuff is all Greek to me. Yeah, 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 easy enough. Okay, thank you. Uh, Denise. Yeah, <clears throat> so I see that it's actually on the list later down. So it sounds like right now you're talking about conditions if it is surplus and sold, but if it was to become like the community resilience hub, would that building still be torn down or, or is it good enough to use for- So the way this deal works for the Commonwealth, it would be un unbelievably expensive for us to buy the property. We would have to pay appraised price. So they're giving it to us for a dollar, but the deal is we have to sell it and then we give them back roughly 50% of the proceeds. If we keep it, we have to have it appraised and their appraisal method is, God knows what they do. They swear it's market, but it, 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 just one example, Laurel Street, we've got legislation surplusing Laurel Street to the city for affordable housing, Laurel Street and Birch Pit, the Commonwealth appraised at $550,000, which didn't work for us for 22 units. We went back and got legislation giving it to us for free which they were willing to do because it was affordable housing. So I have no idea what the numbers would come in at, but I, I just think it's beyond the realm of possibility. Okay, thanks. <clears throat> and I think the building's horrible and as asbestos, and I don't, I don't think there's much to salvage in the building, even though I, I hate waste. I mean, I, you know, I get the embedded energy, but I, I, don't, I think that building's gone. Uh, ben. Uh, it, just since no one else is contributing, I'll, I'll just throw out a general principle that I feel like should be at least considered, and I think this is where you're coming from, is we have no idea what brilliant idea somebody might come up with. So as long as we are able to have some process to evaluate the ideas once they're presented, right? You know, so we, we can say that actually is a terrible idea and we don't want it as a city. We should, we, you know, we need to have that process in place, but I wouldn't take it upon myself to say, I know exactly what the city needs to do with that spot and it'll pay, you know, and it's a good investment for somebody yeah. 
but somebody who's done the work would solve so, the problem. So yes, but I mean the challenge is any bidder wants a somewhat certain environment. So saying, for example, mm -hmm. you need a heat pump or you need a building to be 40 inches thick walls, I'm making it up. Yeah. At least they know when they bid or they don't bid. Oh so yeah. So that's a, a minimum standard, yeah. right? But in terms of, I'm thinking more in terms of the function. In other words, do we need affordable housing? Yeah, yeah. Do we need uh, something that's going to improve the tax base? Uh, you know, we, we'd like that. You know, all of those things are things we want. But I don't know that any one of us here in this group has the business acumen to know for this spot, I can do a thing that's going to be a good, a, a good yep. investment. You know, so I, I, I guess I, I worry that we would constrain ourselves to the, to the world ideas we're capable of thinking of. Right. No, you're absolutely right. But, but again, in terms of getting bidders who could be spending six figures in due diligence, we might have to say, for example, you know, we will give preference to somebody who improves tax base or we give preference to somebody who does afford, you know, we need to give them enough feedback that you'd hate to spend a hundred thousand dollars and then say, say, we don't like it. So yeah, you're that, that's the, you're exact, you have your finger exactly on the stress is we don't know what's going to come, but we need to give someone certainty enough that they give us a good proposal. They stand a chance. So, um, Alex. Could you, I've, I've tried to understand this deal we have with the state a little better. So when, if we, we can put whatever conditions we want, and then we have to accept uh, the highest bidder or given, given the conditions, uh, or do we? No, we don't. We just have to accept a bidder in yep. a fair process. As long as it's not public use, that is, you know, city use, as long as we're selling the property, we can do whatever criteria. I mean, you know, we have normal procurement stuff we have to apply. Um, yeah. There's a whole surplusing piece, but assuming we comply with that, we can do anything we want other than keeping the property ourselves for a resilience hub or a parking lot or that kind of stuff. And if that ends up being that we put so many conditions that the city gets, you know, a very uh, $50,000 for it, for example, you know, that's okay. Yep. We get the $2. State, we write the, the gets Commonwealth for $1. We keep right, right. Okay. So it seems like it's an opportunity to create a, a really good building. I mean, we need to assess, of course, the cost of demolition and the cost of, but, it, but essentially to say, let, let's look at all the things we really want from a climate perspective as well, how I'm thinking now, but you know, from other perspectives as well, and um, not try to make a lot of money from, from selling this since it you know, came to us free, but instead to really think about it from, from the, the whole perspective of, of climate and equity and revitalization. And um, so from that perspective, it seems like climate wise, we should be asking for quite a bit. Uh, to make this a you know a passive house building or a net zero building or something that something in those words um, yep. or that that type if not Alex, those words if I could add yes up in, I mean you know somebody got permitted to build high end apartments on the Goggins real estate site spent a lot of money in design a lot of uh, planning board approval you know long way through and their financing is still uncertain so. If, I mean, Passive House is a good example. A lot of money, but the market is now absorbing Passive House projects. So I would think Passive House is a totally reasonable condition. You probably would get someone to bid on it. I don't know what, you know, if we did a living building challenge, for example, that's probably a step too far. Um, yeah, finding, finding that balance point where it's not going to go into the negative, you know, where it's not worth anything yeah. or no one would bid anything is certainly yeah, exactly. a good question. Uh, Gordon. Um, I just want to say I couldn't agree more with what Alex is saying that taking the time and the opportunity to take a look at uh, how that space could best serve the city and the community, I think is really important and, and uh, making it less of a search for the highest bidder, but as you just clarified for us, we can take $2 and give the state a buck. Um, so with that in mind, I think there are really a lot of things that the city needs uh, some space for. Uh, and the first thing that comes to mind is that area is 
generally got a lot of homeless people uh, hanging out in it. And those people, a lot of them really need a place to stay, a bed to sleep in, a locker to keep their stuff in. Um, and it's, it's right next to the court system um, and, and the police station. So it's, uh, it's an area where, where it's really got a lot of people in need in that area all the time. And if we could find a way to serve those people with that building, I think it would really be good for our community. So I just want to add, um, I, in this same package, again, this is just a brainstorming thing. We were sort of doing a list of what all the properties are going through varying amounts of redevelopment. And one is city council just voted last week on just first reading. So I'm hoping the second reading happens to surplus a piece of property we have at the southerly edge of the city hall parking lot going down to Crafts Avenue. We hired Jones with architects to begin looking at it. We think we can do 20 to 24 units there of what we used to call single room occupancy apartments. We now call studio apartments for exactly the population Gordon was talking about. So we have that underway. We're looking at whether that could also be a resilience hub, not a great site in large part because the new, soonest construction could be is 2023 for that project, yeah. um, but certainly for the unit. So some of the context of what's happening elsewhere out there. Okay, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. You know, the, the other thing that crossed my mind, I believe that at one of the meetings recently, we were told that the uh, resilience center is not actually going to be resilient. Uh, which was kind of fundamentally shocking to me. Um, a building of that size could site, uh, we could site battery storage in there and actually have a power backup for the downtown sited in the downtown. And we can force the utility company to make us an islandable microgrid for emergencies. And we could use a building like that to to store energy and actually make us more resilient. And I think it's really important that we start figuring out where we're going to do that kind of a project. So this is an opportunity to look at it. And even if we're just taking a first look at this kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, great. Other thoughts? Right, and obviously, you know, we'll, we'll be doing community meetings as well. So you get another crack at, you know, in, in your own individual hats at, at, at coming to that process. So um, thank you. This has been very helpful. Um, so next thing on the list, uh, again, you, you've got a copy of this, but let me just put this up on the screen. Um, so, um, you know, at whatever meeting it was, Ben talked about district heating and, and um, is there some opportunities to save space for district heating within Main Street? We started doing due diligence and talking to other uh, for-profit and non-profit consultants. And one of the things that came up is that Eversource is thinking about their very survival, right? So gas is gonna end at some point, you know? I mean, we see how long it lasts as a legacy fuel that's gonna end at some point. And both Eversource and National Grid have pilot programs on to think about district heating. Um, for our area, because we have, and, and utilities aren't supposed to be encouraging fuel shifting. Um, so in our area, Eversource is particularly appealing because if we want to incentivize them to give up gas, it's good to get them to think about district heating. And there are private companies who do this kind of thing. But frankly, the, the regulated monopolies have some greater responsibility to low income residents than a, you know, another for-profit non-regulated monopoly. So um, Cambridge is doing this exact thing. Cambridge is trying to get in on the Eversource um, process. Um, and I don't know if she's gonna call in or not. So we may have a speaker or not in the process. Um, she's not here yet, so I may, come back, we only have 15 minutes left, so I'm assuming she's not coming, but I, this is not my field and first acknowledge what I don't know. So we reached out to Heat, who's a nonprofit consulting firm um, 
funded, so it's great, we like not paying bills, um, funded by foundations who are trying to get this changed. And he's the one who's been walking us through this. Again, this isn't my space. Um, and they, they were the ones who said they thought this is a really good approach to try to get an Eversources pilot. No idea what the chance is of getting that pilot or not, but presumably even if we don't get in phase one, there'd be future phases. They sent me the Cambridge Council order, which I changed to drop lots of things that don't, aren't relevant to us. Hopefully got rid of Cambridge everywhere. Um, but so that's what you have in your package is an order to go before council. And mayor's, mayor's on board with us. Um, it's authorized us to go forward. So in order to go to council either next Thursday, although I'm not gonna be around, or two weeks later, I need to talk to the mayor whether he wants a meeting when I can make it there or not. But so that's sort of the background. Um, you know, we're specifically talking about Main Street being dug up as being an opportunity. There could be some other opportunities as well. Um, I know he is having some conversation with Smith College because, and, and maybe Ben, I think Ben raised this as well in his piece, interlocking utilities could work because you could have different peak times. Um, not sure Smith is interested, but you know, again, that's sort of the process. So, you know, I, I'm not gonna read the whole thing, but big background is yes, we want this, Eversource is doing this work. Um, we have to replace it. Um, and then you know, this is, I wasn't quite sure, and maybe the two counselors will correct me, exactly when things are in order versus a resolution. It's sort of the same thing. This doesn't really have any formal make anything happen, but I did it as an order because it just seemed like a stronger statement, right? We're, you're ordering the city clerk to send this resolution to Eversource. And maybe that should still be a resolution. But, um, so I really want to get both concept and the big picture and the details. Alex? I would say that, uh, you know, in this case, it's clear that we have the support of the mayor's office that the executive branch the executive branch puts forth orders usually and um, then we approve them or not so here we're saying we have both resolutions are just the will of the council got it okay didn't realize that okay and, and you're noticing something go back to the, the very beginning this is obviously a work but so right now it's recommendation of the mayor my office who's, who's overseeing this and we'd like your endorsement as a sponsor Again, you don't have to, but that's part of the ask before you. So details and then sponsorship. Ben, were you raising your hand? Or is that from before? That's just a thumbs up. I'm just oh. super happy and <laughs> yay. That's all I'm saying. All right, because this is, I, go ahead, Denise. I just have a question about the specifics. So is this one pilot project or is this saying that Eversource um, uh, or natural, National Grid could just choose any site that was appropriate in the city or? Uh, is I mean, I, I, we're, I think the short answer is we'll take whatever we can get. Um, I don't know, and I don't really know their process for making decisions. We, we have not talked to them, we've only talked to heat, but I think we take as much as we could get in the process. You know downtown is, in my understanding, again, Ben can correct me, is peak users at different times of day are most desirable. So mixed use is probably more beneficial because you're selling to residents at night and commercial during the day. So downtown is probably where they want. But ben, that's like, you're nodding your head? It, that plus also simultaneous heating and cooling, which allows you to, to shift heat back, you know, from one user to another. Right, okay. Do you, do you know, do we know where their other pilot studies are? What kind of situation? I don't, I mean, the, the only thing I heard was Cambridge is trying to get in, so I'm not sure. I had a sense, again, we were hoping to get someone from Heath, I guess we couldn't make it. I had a mm -hmm. sense that they haven't chosen yet, but I could be wrong on that. Okay. Um, so, if it works for you all, I guess I'd like to do this as a formal motion and vote because we're asking you to sponsor the order. We are reaching out to other people, including HEAT for input. So if you did an order, I, I want the ability to change the language in a minor way, primarily based on HEAT's recommendations. Do you want a, a motion, a move approval? Um, yes, please. Great, I move. Alex moves, second? A second. A second. <laughs> okay. Um, any discussion? 
Okay. Um, Wayne, I vote yes. David? Yes. Um, Louis? Yes. Alex? Yes. Rachel? Yes. Gordon? Yes. Uh, Ashley? Yes. Rich? Yes. And Ben? Yes. Great. It's unanimous. Thank you very much. Um, just um, real quickly, um, the race for second, I missed who got it. <laughs> it was neck and neck. So Gordon and Ben, I'm not sure who won. Okay, it was it was Gordon then. Okay. <laughs> Congratulations. So I, I, ben. I heard Ben second. I wasn't sure who who, who spoke first. Okay. <laughs> Very good work on that, Ben. I appreciate that. <laughs> the whole thing. All right. So next thing the agenda is um, URC zoning. So many years ago now, I'm making this up five years ago, but I'm I'm never trust me in dates. Um, we did zoning, encouraging infill within walking distance of downtown areas. So you, you all know that, you know, we keep talking about this, 29% of our carbon footprint is from transportation. Electrifying that transportation isn't the same thing as reducing the need to transport. So we've been trying to get people within walking distance, um, particularly sort of more or less a thousand feet from downtown. That's, that's the most important area. Um, and we have the opposite problem. For the last 30 years, density is actually dropping down. Now we've had new units being built, um, but those new units, you know, we have a project being built in Ward 3, I think, that's what was a three unit home that's gonna become, I've got maybe Louie knows, but it's like 5,000 square feet. So we're going from three units to one unit. Wouldn't surprise me if only two people live in the, in the unit. Again, making it up. So, I think it's you know, a little we, bit bigger than 5,000 square feet. Oh, really? And actually, yeah, close <laughs> to eight. Oh my goodness, okay. so. You know, and it's not always that, it, but it's often, you know, two units in a building, you know, an old Victorian off South Street, which goes to one unit. And those are only 3,000 square feet, but goes to one unit and two people in them. So, so we're losing people, even though we were gaining units, but losing people. Um, so we introduced zoning a number of years ago, and we said, let's encourage this infill within this URC, sort of the donut around downtown. And it passed city council, but they did one to six units by right, beyond seven units by special permit. What that's resulted in the theory was most special permits don't get denied. Well, it's resulted in a lot of six unit projects. Most developers don't want to go through the process. And so we're just not getting those units in the process. Youth commission approached us and said, you know, how can we help? What are the things it really takes for sustainability in, in an area which maybe you had a political battle which you lost? And we want to reopen. And Carolyn met with them and said, well, here's a good one to think about. Um, and so we're working with Youth Commission. They're very excited and they're going to carry the water for some of this. And so what we're doing is basically reopening this up and saying, you know, this is sustainable in Hampton 2008 said more units closer to downtown. The climate resiliency plan says that. Let's reopen that. And at the same time, let's think about the same language that you all discussed for affordable housing, two family homes and, and, half, you know, uh, and half scale homes. Yeah. So right now, if you're, let me scroll down, it's crossed out because it's what we're dropping. But right now, if you're doing seven or more units, you need, to, you need to do a number of things. And one of those things is varying ways to be energy efficient. So a HERS rating 25% less than the municipal standard of the time, but no less than 47 or 41, depending on the size of the unit, um, or lead new construct, right? So, so we already have some language for those larger projects. The language was five years ago when a HER rating of 41 was great. Now a HER rating of 41 is, you know, close to what we're getting. Um, so we're coming back and saying, let's go further than that and let's apply to all these units. So this would apply in URC to any unit more than 2000 square feet, except for a single family home. So an 8,000 square foot home, this wouldn't apply for, or two of these half scale units. Half scale units are up to 800 square feet each, so, or maybe it's 900 square feet. So it's less than 2000 square feet anyway. So we're saying is for all those other multifamily, this fits what Gordon was saying about 33 King Street, right? We're giving you something for density. We want something back. And so the draft language is per rating of no more than 40, 
We're not gonna do it by the scale of the building, which is a great thing. Um, and passive house, I'm mean, sorry, or passive house certified or not, um, or net zero ready building um, and electrical, uh, oh, and, and sorry, but it's above this, and electricity, uh, no fossil fuels, basically. Um, so this is the language to get your input on. I know the rest of the stuff further down doesn't have to do with this commission. Alex. Um, great, so, I'm, so I just wanna uh, try to understand some of the differences. So first you're saying that uh, you're changing it. Right now it's only two families or half scale units or affordable housing that requires fossil fuel free. Well, the, or it's one of the choices, oh, I'm sorry, for fossil fuel free, yes. The HERS rating we have for over seven, but yes, you're right. Right. Um, so the, 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 the change here is that you will re uh, require, so it, it, so the, there's only, so three family to six family, three family and up will require um, fossil fuel free. In the URC. Correct. In the URC. And um, however, a half scale unit, if you just are building two, it will not have to be. Um, right, but remember a, half scale units by definition, two of them together would still be below 2,000 square feet. Right, I see, but okay, okay, right. But the, the later it's saying, or presently it says half scale units shall not have any, oh, I see. But if, if you built two half scale units, you wouldn't, they could be use fossil fuels in the present? in the present configuration? We're not adding anything now. I can't remember what that ordinance did for half scale in the URC. So this wouldn't change whatever that recent ordinance did, Alex. Okay, yeah. It's under this section, we're adding new stuff. Great, and then we're not requiring the special permit, but asking for more, even more things. Um, That's correct. Still site plan approval to make yeah. sure they do those things, but yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah, no, it sounds great. I know that Councillor Maori and I have been thinking and talking with Carolyn Mish about moving forward on um, requiring, you know, three unit and up to also be fossil fuel free and not just those others. So this, this seems like a great addition. Um, and, you know, we can move forward separately thinking about uh, whether that's appropriate in other zones um, yeah. like URB. I, and I do need to disclose that you heard us say this before for the two families. We're pushing the edge of where the city solicitor is going to recommend this, you know, as can we get away with this? And we have not yet taken this through him. Yeah, I, I've had some good conversations with him about it. And his, uh, his, my perspective on his opinion is that um, if you are, that, that we don't have to give anything other than single family, uh, as, and, and we are giving additional density to allow more than single family houses in these residential districts. And so we are allowed to, it, is, it, is, it would be allowed for us to ask for things in oh, exchange great. for Good. that addition. Okay, he's evolved then. So I'm, I'm glad to hear that. Great, um, Gordon. Uh, so I, I guess my, that, that sort of answers my question, but if you guys could just clarify for me, we're not allowed to enforce this with single family. Right, so the issue is Massachusetts has a statewide building code and the statewide building code specifically says and communities can't get around the building code by substituting their own language. And then the zoning act specifically says you can't do stuff that's basically in the building code. So the justification is, yes, you have a God-given right to do something. It doesn't have to be single family. You know, in some places it could be some, some other use, but you have a God-given, we, we have to give you a God-given right to do something. And anything extra we give you, then we can put incentives. They're voluntary, in essence. So single family homes, most often, you know, it could be hotels. We could say hotels are allowed by right, and anything else needs a special permit and needs special standards. But can, can we say they give, they've got a God-given right to put a garage there? And then no, it has to be something with a real return, right? Uh, you know, so we oh, yes. have to be careful of that. But you know, yeah. So, but it's a pretty broad. I mean, given that we're not allowed to touch building code and energy performance is building code. I have to say our, and the city solicitor, even if he's willing to do this, is the first to say someone could sue us someday and we could lose. But 
towns, as some of you may know this, towns need to have zoning approved by the attorney general. Cities don't. It doesn't protect us from being sued, but it gives us a presumption we lack capacity. Gordon, does that answer your question? I, I think so, yes, thanks. Okay, uh, Ben. Um, so I, I just need to ask more questions just to understand. So we're obviously limited in what sort of leverage we have. Right now, the leverage is to make it harder, just because it's the only people we have leverage on, to do anything other than single family housing, right? So the, basically, what we, I think what we want is more housing. And the way to get it is to have it be multifamily. And this makes it more difficult, not impossible, not very hard, but more difficult to do that. Do we have a, a carrot? Because <laughs> right now, we're, all we have is stick. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, no, I mean, this is similar to 33 King Street conversation. If we knew the market really well, we'd figure out how far can we push before we lose the units. Yeah. I think we don't really know that. I think we know, you know, Louie was very involved with figuring out what the her rating was five years ago. And it was sort of, I, I think I don't put words in your mouth, Louie, but it was the things where he felt like we could push people a little bit, but not push them so far that they wouldn't do the process. Um, we are giving them density. I mean, a special permit where we are now is a really scary process. Both because the board could say no, but more importantly, it's, it's really easy to appeal a special permit. Even if you know you're gonna lose, you can delay a project three years and three years will kill most investment projects. And so for that reason, it scares away developers even when they know they're gonna get a special permit. So that's a big carrot, um, but is it big enough carrot? I don't know the answer. Does, Ben, this is really a question for you and you brought this up, does forcing electrification actually cost more? No, not, not anymore. Um, and not if, if, if you don't have the ability to hook up to natural gas, <laughs> right? Um, it, you know, so it's, it, it's like, yes, if we've got the moratorium in place, then it's cheaper to go all electric. And there are, there are ways to balance envelope uh, heat recovery ventilation against a smaller system, you know, so, so a, again, it's down to good design versus bad design, right? Good design, you can make it be cheaper to be electric and you can avoid all sorts of upfront costs having to do with connecting to gas or installing fossil fuel infrastructure. Not everybody does good design. Um, so that's one part of it, um, but it's still, I mean, honestly, this isn't that big of an ask. It's just, it's a thing we really, really want. And yet all we have is, is, a, is, a, st is a stick. <laughs> and I, like uh, you, you say it's not really our, our area, but I think the business about streets and ro roadways actually is because again, it's what makes it easy to have a community. It's what e makes it easy to, to make something really walkable and bikeable. Um, and, you know, and so those are great things. Is there a way that we can make that not just a requirement, but an enticement? Is there, and this is kind of well outside my expertise about like, how can we, like, I'm just reading the language. I'm getting a little confused. Is, is this good or is this hard or easier to achieve? But somebody who no, does know this, how can we make that infrastructure maybe part of the appeal to building multi-units in this area? Yeah, I mean, I think what we're pushing, if this answers it, is um, downtown's an attractive place and we want new development to sort of match the good things we have. We're, we're not necessarily saying, you know, we have not so much in Northampton, but in a lot of the United States, we have really ugly suburban development stuff. And what makes downtown more valuable is that people like that streetscape stuff. And so we're trying to, in essence, match what we have to the extent possible um, in the process. I should have something. I'm sorry, this is going back to the last item, but something that Ben said remind me when, when Ben was talking about the moratorium. When we talked to Heat, one reason that they thought that Eversource might be interested is given how crappy our pipes are. I mean, we have more leaks than a lot of natural gas pipelines. We have the moratorium. And so Eversource, you know, if you have good pipes, they're good for another 20 years, Eversource might just coast and get their money out of it. 
but in Northampton, a lot of it, they have to make a decision fairly soon. Are we going to replace these pipes? Or are we going to abandon them? And so that's what could make us a more attractive pilot than a, you know, a newer suburb where they built lots of pipes 10 years ago. Alex. Um, I, yeah, just looking at the time, I know we need to end. And oh, I thank you. Yeah. Um, saw that we canceled, I believe, uh, for November. And I wonder if given, you know, we still have much more, we want to continue the retreat. Um, if we could find a, a time in November to meet, uh, perhaps the Tuesday before Thanksgiving, uh, like we have in past years, uh, just to not get further behind. Yeah, and I actually was going to request an additional meeting in November. I would like to see two meetings. We clearly had an enormous amount that we needed to go over today, but we have a good bit that we still need to discuss in our retreat and we need to continue our ongoing work. I'm requesting two meetings in November. All right, so you're right, we're over. So let's, just, let's, let's look at the calendar and figure that out and then, then end. Um, so let me, let's first start to do backwards. So in terms of Gordon's request, people's thoughts, you want an extra meeting? That's really your call. Rachel. Yeah, I think I think kind of essential that we continue um, and, and kind of find a way to really act on every all those fundamental changes we talked about last time. I was kind of surprised, frankly, that that wasn't going to be continued to this meeting because I mean, those are really big, big changes. And I, I think we'd, I'd like to see them enacted as soon as possible while they're still fresh. And frankly, going into a new council, there's no guarantee that Council Jared or, or I will still be here. And I just think, uh, I, anyway, so I think we need to continue and enact, not just continue, but also have some concrete steps from that retreat because to me, it was very fruitful. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't and know what else has to be on the agenda. So I don't know, I guess I don't know whether to say two meetings because I don't know. Uh, I see we have some dangling um, conversations here, but. But we certainly do need to um, we do, do need to act on those retreat um, items. Yeah, and so we're doing some already. Obviously, that's the, the tracking sheet was the, the the main thing we're doing already. But well, so let's let's pull your condos and maybe it's going to be can we actually find times that work for people? Right. Um, and that may determine. Um, so did I hear someone say Tuesday? So Thursday is always harder because meetings, but to, so. Is someone throwing out Tuesdays? Uh, Tuesday, the 23rd or the 30th. Hmm. Work for me. I'm going to run into the issue of um, council rules, uh, Council Jarrett. That's on the 23rd, but not the 30th. Well, yeah, we're not sure yet. But, oh. Okay. But, but, you know, we're the first come, so we haven't scheduled it, so. Um, yeah, I know you probably <laughs> wouldn't want to do it back to back, but, you know, we could do this at four and, and sure. now at six. <laughs> Uh, true. That's it's, actually it's true. That's true. And if I have to leave a few minutes early, that's a good point. Is if it's at four, then I could um, chair at six and that'll be okay. So 23rd at four out for other people. Does that work? Wow. Or the that 30th? Amazing. That's like the hardest. I thought we were talking about the 30th. No, you're talking about the 23rd. Oh, sorry, I'm, I'm, whatever. 30th? Well, the 30th, we don't, I don't, we, there's no council rules meeting uh, planned. So I, you know, in a sense, that would be better because we're not. But if the twenty, but if we run in, but because that was such a wonderful moment, I don't know if we want to to hurt that moment. So let me just. Because um, the thirtieth work for it. I wouldn't be able to make it until five on the thirtieth. Hmm. And Ashley, would the twenty third be better for you? Yeah, I can do that. Okay, so let's Rachel, stick with that. Let's which one? You're okay with the twenty third? Yep. Okay, that was coffee. So <laughs> All right, so for the 18th. Oh, 18th. Was, uh... okay. 18th. Of we November? Have... Oh, yeah, we have a council. Well, mm, we have a council meeting, but uh, it's earlier, later. So that would, I guess. What, what do you think, Council Jared? Is that too long a call? Council rules is. We're now talking about our second, a potential second meeting. Is that correct? No, we were just talking about an earlier meeting for November 18th, but I think the oh. 23rd might be better. 
if that's okay with everyone, because council meetings, full council meetings can go on for like five hours or the other or six, seven. <laughs> Nine is our record. <laughs> Nine at three in the morning is our, was it three, two, two morning? All right, so we have a meeting on the 23rd at four and then are we looking for a second meeting? If so, what dates would work for that? Right. Um, well, I mean, I guess I'm wondering how much of it, do you think we would have enough space and time to, to really look at the retreat? Because it's not just, we're, we're also talking about process changes, structural I'm, changes. I'm okay with there being one meeting if that is the retreat continuation meeting. So it's really up to you all. I mean, it's the issue is deadlines happen. So, you know, one of the things I, I heard people say clearly in the retreat is hit you early in the process so we can have your input. Um, and so it's really your call. But, but you know, something like the URC, some of we talked about today are gonna to be moving forward. So can, it's, it's, can we give you 15 minutes to work with Mr. Chairman? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll take whatever, have much or how little as you want. It's not, I mean, I don't, unlike this meeting where we had two months worth of items, yeah. We're going to have three weeks worth of items, so okay. probably fine. Not sure it's coming out. Okay, then if we could do that, I I would I would be good with that. We give you a little bit of time to to brief us on stuff, which we absolutely do want. Okay. Uh, then let's get back to the retreat and uh, and let's figure out our process for going forward. Okay, that sounds great. And I apologize, I wasn't off to the clock, so I'm sorry I kept you all a little bit later. Thank and you. talk to you the twenty third, if not before. Good night. Thanks, everyone. Good night. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Thanks. Good night.